Hello and welcome to another episode of Mental Health, The New Wealth. I am your host, Nikita Nicole, the Illuminist, and I am so excited that you decided to join me for yet another episode. Relationships are one of the most hardest yet important things that we must work at to cultivate. We have relationships with so many things that is too many to count. A lot of who we are start from our familiar relationships. We learn and understand how to cultivate relationships, communicate, and relate one to another from the people who came together and gave us life. Whether you grow up with your biological parents or not, the genetics in which they carry and generational ties that they have often create the building blocks for who you are today. We cannot assume that being raised by our parents afford us the luxury of having a childhood free of trauma that assist and building dysfunctional practices, behaviors, and characteristics. It is your job as you grow in adulthood to determine the person that you wanna be and what parts of your upbringing you want to keep or discard for optimal growth and living. Join me in this episode as I talk to someone that I know very, very well because she is my mother. We will discuss parts of her upbringing that cultivated who she was at the time and her mindset and bringing me into this world. And last but not least, we definitely will discuss where she is now. She will kick off the first single person interview in this relationship series, as there will be many more. So sit back, relax, and let's get into this episode. Before we get into this episode, let me say that I am not a licensed mental health professional nor a doctor, although I will host licensed professionals as guests from time to time. The mental health difficulties discussed on this podcast will come from extensive research, life experiences of myself and others, and are not to be taken as diagnosis, prescription, or cure to any health mental difficulties or disorders. If you are experiencing deep mental health difficulties of any kind and have lasted for any duration of time, please contact your local mental health professional for assistance with treatment. If you or someone you know is suffering with mental distress or thoughts of suicide, you are not alone. Please call the toll-free National Suicide Prevention Hotline, open 24-7 at 1-800-273-273. 8255. Again, that is 1 800 273 8255. Now let's get into the episode. Hello, and thank you for joining me on another episode of Mental Health, The New Wealth. I am your host, Nikita Nicole, and we are getting started with this relationship series. And I am so excited because she's not really a special guest to me. She's just somebody that is a part of my everyday life. Can't live with her, can't live without her. But we have the one and only, the none other, Vernita Whitaker Naylor. How are you today, sus? I am doing well, daughter. Thank you for having me. She's so boosy, ain't she? She already getting started. So. I am starting this relationship series, and it's very important because our relationships play a major part in how we function on an everyday basis, our support systems, and how we are able to move forward in our everyday lives. So this is someone who is very important in my life in general. If she had not been here, I would have not been here, but also someone who has been in my corner and a major support to me and has also been a major relationship vehicle in my life. So this is why I decided to make her my first guest in this relationship series. And so thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking out the time to do this. Who is Vernita Whitaker Naylor these days? I am a mother, spiritual being, mentor, friend, a lover of life, a person who tries to maintain balance. I just really want to just make sure that I am the being that I was set to be. And over the course of my life, I've become this person. While I have some things that have been constant, this is who I am today. Okay, so I, I understand. Um, you're floating on clouds. 
<laughs> and um, you're yes. doing the best to make sure everyone also is aligned and floating right. on clouds also. Right. But sis wasn't always like that. Okay. No, not close to it. So in this relationship series, let's set some foundation. So we were basically raised in Oakland, California, West Oakland to be exact. <laughs> Don't get it messed up. Um, and so that was our foundation. And so she started there before I did. So let's just talk about a little bit of your foundation, your parents, you know, you being an only child and then having siblings. And so let's talk a little bit about that foundation and what that looked like for you and how that really just molded who you were in your younger, early years. So I really looked at it as a true humble beginnings because I was with my parents, my mom and my dad for quite a while by myself. I would say between seven to eight years old. And then all of a sudden, my sisters, three of them, came to live with us. And I think they were in junior high and high school. Okay. And then seven years later, my brother came. So I went from being alone to having a house full of people, four people to be exact, um, that was around my age as a child and in addition to my two parents. So that was like, what, seven people? So we went from three to seven people in a matter of probably seven, eight years. So what I remember was um, as a kid, we would go visit my sisters in Arkansas and I would play with them. And then all of a sudden they were living with us. And then my brother came. So it was kind of traumatic because I remember crying a lot because I had to share everything, my parents, my room, my life, my toys. I just had to share. On the flip side, I kind of enjoyed it a little bit because one sister was three to four years older than me. So it was kind of okay, but it was really different because they were by themselves, the three sisters, my brother was by himself, and then I was by myself. And then we're all trying to join together and my parents trying to parent according to that new dynamic. Yes, that was mm -hmm. created. But over a period of time, I have come to appreciate that part because if I had been an only child, I think I would not have been as well-rounded as I am today. You know, I asked my mom one day as I got older, I said, why didn't you prepare me? Why didn't you let me know that you were going to actually do that? And she said, well, your father kept on saying, go get your kids, go get your kids. And I decided to go do that. But my whole thing was me being a child. Why didn't you prepare me? Why didn't you help me to understand these individuals that you play with every summer? They're going to be living with us. So it can really be detrimental to a young child to add these dynamics to a person's life, because then these sisters now are trying to get adjusted to a much younger sister who have a totally different lifestyle. It was just a, a whole lot going on. And I just wanted to point out, as you said, that a lot of parents don't talk to their children and yes. they feel like they can just make decisions and their child is just going to have to adapt to that. And it's very important to understand that it's really important to talk to your children. They are people too. They have feelings, they have emotions, and not that you have to, you know, weigh in on their opinion, but it's really good to be able to speak with them and let them know about major changes that are going to happen in their life. However, I can say that communication in general is something that you need to know how to do. Right. And we cannot assume that everyone, because you are a parent, does not give you the green light that you all of a sudden know how to communicate and communicate effectively. And then let me also add that although they were not innately my grandfather's children, he was adamant about caring for them, loving on them, yes. not making a difference in between any of them as I was growing up. We all were family. We all were loved by him in the same way. And speaking about my grandfather, because I'm a grandfather's baby, y'all who do know me know I love me some Virtus Whitaker. <laughs> and those of you who don't know, I love my grandfather. But in saying that, he grew up in the South, so did my grandmother. Yes. And um, we were raised very rough. 
Yes. Like my grandfather did not pull no punches, no chaser. Even my friends that used to come over, I used to prepare them. Look, <laughs> he's going to insult you. Yeah. He's going to say crazy things about you. And that's just who he was. But that was his way of saying, hello, how you doing? That was his way of checking you out. And I'm pretty sure there was an easier way to do that. He just did not embody that way. But I'm saying all this to give you character and a foundation to what we're dealing with. So knowing that my grandfather ruled with an iron fist and he was not about the games, how did you feel about being raised by someone that was so stern, no BS, and kind of at times not understanding at all? It was pretty much his way or the highway. I, you know, what, what did you feel about that? Um, with my father, wow, it was really rough. He had 11 or 12 other siblings. It was half boys and half girls. And he acted like I was one of the sisters because he was very strict. And I heard that he was like that with his sisters as well. Let me give you a little bit of background. So my father was the last one of all the siblings to leave Mississippi Panther Burn. And his thing was to make sure each sibling was well vetted in whatever they wanted to do. And so he decided to stay behind with his mother to make sure each sibling went away and did whatever they wanted to do. So he, in his early 20s, came all the way to California by himself. And that's where it all started. So he had this iron fist mentality because they said he did not play when he was in Mississippi. He had another daughter that was much older than me that did not live with us. But when I came along, I was the namesake. So that's why my name is Vernita because his name is Virtus. And even though he wanted a boy, he treated me as such. And so he was strict. He did not play. And so it was really hard dating because his whole thing was he would be at the school, whether it's elementary, junior high or high school, he would be at the school. He would work at night on purpose so that he can be able to watch us because his whole thing was, you're not going to get pregnant on my dime. You're not going to be a slacker on my dime. And that's how he even did the grandkids. And so it was really something for me to be able to be under his thumb like that. And then when my sisters came, he started doing the same thing with them. And the rule was the same. Then my brother came, who's also named Virtus. He did the same thing with him. So my dad was just that person who, regardless of my mother being there as well, he was like, I'm the man, this is how it's going to be, and this is how we're going to work this. And it was very frightful for me. Mentally, it was really hard because he was almost like a military sailor. You know, he did discipline us. He would cuss us out. He would call us names. And you had to make a decision how you're going to deal with that. Are you going to let that cause you to be oppressed or are you going to rise above it and say, he ain't talking to me? And I took the latter. I heard what he said, but my attitude was, he ain't talking to me. And one thing he did, even though he was the person he was, he said, I'm going to teach you about men. And he said, if a man does this, this is what they're doing. This is what it means. And I want you to do this as a woman. Because his whole thing was, I'm a man, men take advantage of women, and I want you to be able to survive without being wounded and hurt. Because one thing he used to always tell me, if a man is up to no good, he can look at a woman and tell if he can take advantage of her. So I want to make sure you're not going to be one of those women, regardless of how he acted with women, including my mother, he wanted to make sure I was not going to succumb to that type of life. And that was interesting too, because there is a lot of times when men in our lives have an attitude, don't do like you see me do, be better than me. And I remember that that was kind of the concept. My grandfather, he wasn't a stranger to his gen. He loved women. You know, my grandmother was always there. They were always in a marriage, but he had his 
preferences and his habits and his idiosyncrasies. Even though we saw him do different things, it was like, mind your business, you don't do that. You don't be like that. You don't let a man do this, that, and the third. So that was on one spectrum. But the other spectrum is, I feel like if we had those OGs and those people in our lives to kind of steer us in that way and really give us the game, there's really no matriarchs and patriarchs right now. No one wants to be a grandmother or a grandfather. Everybody is trying to be young and fancy free, I guess, because now we're having younger grandparents. But even our uncles, aunties, it's, it's important to get that gain from a woman, but more important to get it from a man because men know how other men are. So to give you some telltale signs, like you were saying, if a guy does this, then this is where their mind is at. It doesn't mean that that's like end all of all, but at least it gave you a parameter right. to look at men in a way to where, okay, is this a provider? Is this person a liar? Is this person a cheater? Is this person trustworthy? Is this person responsible? Things of that nature. So I feel like if we had that in our lives on a regular basis, we would be better off as being feminine energies in this world because we had structure given to us by our divine masculines. One thing that was really profound for me was, and it was a mental thing, was he showed and talked about love versus helping others. His thing with my mom was I never loved her, but I wanted to help her. And I found myself repeating that without knowing it. I noticed that I would bring men by the house and he would tell me, he's good for you, he's not. He's going to make it, he's not. As I started dealing with men, I noticed that I needed to shift and make a difference, make a change, because I was repeating what he was doing and not allowing myself to love, which is a great mental barrier because that means that you're not willing to give of yourself. And that was me. I'll give of myself to help you if you had an issue or something that you needed help with. But to sacrifice and give of myself, I just couldn't do that. So it was really interesting to see how generationally things can really impact your mentality and how you move forward. So when you say that, let's break that down. So in the mental context, what was that? That was, you didn't want to be vulnerable. It was abandonment. Like what was that, that you didn't allow people to come in? Well, it was so many things. So looking at the fact of how my parents did, bringing my sisters. So it was like, you don't care enough about me. With my dad telling me, this is how men are. Mm -hmm. And then him telling me about love versus helping. It was all those different things. And you're junior high, high school. Then I'm having you at 19, got married at 18, trying to figure this out. It's like, okay, I'm confused. I don't know what's going on. And it became a mental worrying within me. So I don't know what it was at that time. I just said to myself, this is a lot to unpack. You know, I got to figure this out. I had all these scholarships to these prestigious colleges, but instead I pretty much married the first person that asked me. And that was your dad. <laughs> well, dang, that was real <laughs> sweet, deep and romantic. <laughs> And that's just something to say to everyone, too, because... And let me say this, full scholarship. Okay. Okay. All right, we clear. Okay, y'all. She was going places and then turned into slacker because she had to have me. I ruined everything. Okay, but I just wanted to kind of go back to where you were saying you married the first person that asked you. And so I feel like a lot of us do that as men and women when we're tired, when we want to get out of our situations, mm -hmm. when we don't feel like waiting. Mm -hmm. And that's important to know because even though I was the best thing that ever happened to yes, you yes. in your whole entire life and still am, however, it was just like, where would you have been if you didn't do that? Where would a lot of us have been if we were more selective about the choices that we made about who we decided to be with? and really took stock of who we are and what would be the best 
decisions for ourselves instead of just taking the first job that wants us, instead of just getting in the first relationship with somebody who wants us, with marrying the first person just ask you, oh, I don't even particularly like you, but you like me. So come on, let's go. I don't, I don't really see you as marriage material, but you asked me. So come on, let's go. Where would we be? How different would our lives be if we were more selective about what we deserve in our lives? And so you saying that was just like major. And I really appreciate your transparency as talking about that. And just saying that you were kind of confused. You didn't know which way to go. You were living in a stern household. You got pregnant and then you got married very quickly and so then what happened after that um like i said by having the scholarships and everything and like you said i wasn't thinking clearly your dad went to get married and i said okay and i didn't know i was pregnant till i was six months irresponsible it's six months and what so i could have sued kaiser permanente by now but um, we did the urine test, we did the blood test, and they could not find a baby. And I went to Highland County Hospital because my sister Joanne said, I think you're pregnant because I was 110 pounds soaking wet. And I said, you think so? And she said, yeah. And they did an ultrasound and they said, ma'am, you're pregnant. And I was like, what? So you didn't have no prenatal care or none. nothing that whole six months? None, none. And thank God I was healthy. I used to work out, you know, do all those things. And I told God then... I used to pray over you and I said, Lord, let her have all her limbs, not have any mental disabilities or anything. And if you help me to raise her, having a husband or not, I will give her back to you when she gets older. And that's what I did. Well, I'm glad that I'm here. I'm mostly in my right mind most of the time. <laughs> but I'm here in my right mind. I got all my limbs. Yes. I know I was a preemie, but yes. you know, I was here because by your calculations, what I only had like three months. A month three? three okay, months like three months left. I'm just happy that I'm here. I'm well. So talk about your mental space now and being a parent. And then I guess later on, um, a single mom. How did that work out? Well, it was a transition, um, once again, trying to unpack how I was raised. And so my thing was, okay, these are some things I didn't like with my upbringing. So I'm gonna do some things different. And it took a lot of prayer. I mean, even though I was married, it took a lot of prayer because your dad, he was not that parent type person. He was a good person, but he was not that parent. And so being 19 and trying to raise a human being, it was like, this is a big responsibility. And I was constantly worrying because I want to be a young person, but then I'm a mom and a wife at the same time. So it was a continual, continual ebb and flow of, okay, I need to be responsible, but I want to go partying. I need to be responsible, but I got to buy diapers. I need to be responsible, but I want to do this. So it was constant, you know, okay. So I told myself, you need to deny yourself for this many years and you need to take it upon yourself to raise this person. Because if you don't raise this person and do the best you can, this person can be a burden to you for the rest of your life because you were selfish and decided not to take this person under your wings and teach them and treat them like a viable woman in this world should be. And that's what I had to do. Well, I appreciate that. I remember um, that there were times when I was young and as the only child also myself, people like, do you get this and you get that? I'm like, nah, I don't, I don't get all that. Like you be thinking, I mean, I always had snacks and stuff, you know what I'm saying? But you know, all the things that you think that, uh, single child would have because it's only me I wasn't spoiled in that way you know right. what I'm saying I was spoiled in other ways I learned what traveling is early I learned hotel and massages. concierge yeah massages and treatments I didn't learn you know just a whole bunch of clothes and material things in that way and so that was the life that uh you afforded me to have but i remember in some of those times you were not always the most pleasant you know and mm -hmm. i was like dang right. she heck of me <laughs> but i mean i guess as a woman and ha having to consciously deny yourself at every turn i'm um, getting into this in a relationship and then ending up as a single parent you know, I'm pretty sure that it wasn't a happy place to be because that's not what you 
intended. Now, that's not how you saw it set up, especially um, after the fact when you had scholarships or whatever have you that you could have taken and now you have to provide for this other person. But I do think that that's why God allowed me to be in there and doing my thing for so long because I was well past the point of you getting rid of me. You would have had to, you know, give me up for adoption or something because I was going to be here in this world. Right, right. One thing you have to really realize when you're young, you feel like that you are against the wall because parents do the best that they can, but the child doesn't know that. And so at that time, being married, having a child, I'm like, what am I going to do? So I said, okay, abortion's too late. Then I said, well, maybe I'll do adoption. Then my conscience said, okay, so you're going to put this person up for adoption. They look for you when they become 18, 25, 35. And your reason for giving them up for adoption will be what? Because you wanted to have fun and you want to be 19, 20, whatever. I'm like, yeah. And my spirit said, no. I'm going to help you to raise her and it's going to be all right. And this is what you're going to do. You will have fun on occasion, but it was like, it was time for me to really seriously get into church because once again, it was that sacrifice and it was that time for me to raise this person to be a person that's going to be a quality of substance. And because she has a legacy being pregnant at six months and not knowing it, she has a purpose and God had a plan for her. So that was the thing. So, and that was, uh, you know, unique in itself. And like you said, definitely having a purpose and legacy. Like it was by no mistake that God was making sure that it was nothing that you were able to do. You know what I'm saying? For me right. to get here. And I definitely did. So I appreciate the divine just for that intervention and allowing me to be here. I know that I was a different child, always very creative, always very kind of spunky. And what was it as a single parent raising me? Because as I mentioned before, you weren't always pleasant. And I know that it wasn't something that was ideal, but you had made this pact with yourself that you're going to raise a quality human being. But I wasn't, like you said, at the time as a child, I didn't know that. How was it, you know, raising me and like such a free thinker, you know, such a person that did their own thing, and you having your own upbringing. So you having from your father and your parents in general, what raising a child looks like, how did you mentally determine what you were going to do, what you were not going to do? Like, how did you decide to come up with your own formulation in raising me? Well, it might sound like a cliche, but God was in it all the way from day one. And that's when I really established my personal relationship with the Most High, because Every step of the way, he provided from the job to where we live. I mean, we moved so much because it's like, okay, time to uproot her out of this school, put her in that school. You know, I wasn't allowed to go into certain areas because we didn't really live in the area, but we got into school anyway. And that was a constant ebb and flow. Um, even giving you extra homework where it got to the point that even early elementary you were supposed to be skipped like two or three grades. And I was like, no, nah, we're not doing that. But I want to make sure I prepared you. And it was a constant thing. And yeah, being mean, it was like, I am not your friend. I'm here to raise you. I'm making this sacrifice. I got to be in it all 100 and some. I couldn't sit up here and be a friend and sacrifice my life and think it's a game. It was not a game. I really took this personal. God gave me this assignment and that's what I did. Now, yeah, I was mean at times because at the same time, I'm a kid, you know, and I'm like, shoot, I want to go and do this. I want to go and buy this, you know, because you have this aspiration of what you want to do when you're young, but it was like, no. And that's why I also made sure that you were healthy, you exercise, you ate right. Because I want to make sure I gave you my best. And that's what I did. But at the same time, I wasn't happy because of the sacrifice. But once again, God kept on saying, if you do this, you will be blessed. And that's all I kept on thinking about. So it's like, you're not her friend. She don't need those shoes. She don't need this. 
you can't even buy a house because you're trying to uproot every time and go from here to here to here to here to put her in the best of schools. Your goal, Vernita, is to raise her the way I tell you to raise her. And that's what I did. Okay, it was clear. Sis made sure she let me know every day almost that I'm making sacrifices. And <laughs> so it was understood. And so for me, you know, mentally in that space, it was a lot of pressure on me and I developed some mental difficulties due to that. But I mean, there was different things that um, I accumulated over the years that I am now working through, but I do appreciate your sacrifices. So I'm, I'm telling you over the ways on this stream so everybody can hear. I appreciate you. I love you. And I thank you for the sacrifices that you have made because I was not always the best child. But I want to speak to the repetitiveness of generations because you were so hard on me, almost resembling kind of like the grandfather thing minus the womanizing and the alcoholism. So I was just like, you know what? You're doing too much, sis. Calm <laughs> down. Like, I can't have no dude. I can't do this. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I decided also to run away. Check this out, y'all. Guess what she did, right? No, tell them what I told you before that, though. What you said? We can talk about anything. Yes, I might be mean, but we can talk about anything. But if you ever run away, your room will be packed. Whatever. Didn't nobody remember that anyway. So <laughs> this is what happened. So she was doing too much per usual. And then I went ahead and ran away. I had this like raggedy ass boyfriend. He was so raggedy, but we ran away or whatever. Well, I ran away with him. He had a home and stuff. I was just, you know, acting like a street, hey, street kid when I wasn't even that type of kid. But anyway, so ran away and was like, she get on my nerves. I hate her. She don't never let me do nothing. I was gone, I think, for like a week. Yep, and I, I had a phone call. call the you, it's, can I tell it? Because there's a pride that you have in abandonment. <laughs> No, when there's a pride there and i'm trying to tell my story i, I, I have know. issues regarding this right now okay, like sorry, thank you let me tell my sorry, truth sorry. you've already okay thank uh, you and like she said she's so proud no. she did not look for me she did not call nothing i swore like because i had a phone me. the whole time and i was just like oh okay i know she's gonna call my phone i know she's gonna be looking for me sis did not look for the kid she did not look for me. She didn't call none of my friends and check. She just did not care. And I was just God like, was well, talking. I thought I was going to run away. And she was going to be like, where my baby at? And she was like, dang, they're like, fuck them kids. So I ran away. I finally was just like, okay, I'm not about this life. I need some more clothes. Like, this ain't feed me right. Like, I'm breaking out. Like, there was a certain level of care <laughs> that I was used to that he was not keeping up. So I was like, okay, we played this for long enough. I'm about to go home. And then his parents was like, yeah, you got to go home or whatever. Because I was like sneaking in his room. Girl, it was just so ratchet. So I ended up going home. I called. And my mom was like one word in me. I was like, mom, I'm ready to come home. And she was like, come on. So I was like, okay, dang, that's all you got to say is come on. Well, okay. So I came or whatever, got there or whatever. So when I got to the house, why she had my bed broke down? Like at the jail, my whole room was broke down like that. Wasn't no more posters on the wall. Wasn't no books on the shelf. I'm like, damn, you had to break, break down the bookshelf. Like, sis was in there irritated. So I got there. My bed was broke down like at the jailhouse. And my daddy was there. Why is this man here? Like, what? Oh, it's, it's heck of funny. Y'all hear her laughing? It's funny. It's, it's no, it's joke. not. It's, no, it's so not. Oh, God. I got there. So I was just like, for real? Now I'm mad. I done came home, ready to take my shower and get back to my life. And system broke down my bed. And she was just like, okay, so you're back. I'm glad you're safe or whatever. She was trying to act because she didn't call the whole time. Anyway, so she was like, I'm glad you're safe or whatever. And you going to live with your daddy. And I was like, what you mean? Like, it's people over there. Like, what? You, he don't even got no room like that. And my daddy was like, you're coming over here to live with me. And, you know, me and my wife and the kids. And this is what's going on. And I was like, I can't stand none of y'all. Like, I can't. Whatever. And so, but I'll say that to say. The transition on um, moving with my dad, I understood what a provider was. Not necessarily a parent, but a provider. 
someone who is going to get up every day and provide for his family. The light's going to be on. We're going to have food to eat. He might not talk to you about a whole lot because he's tired, you know what I'm saying, from his day. But he was, in fact, a provider. But also living in that environment with my two younger brothers and my stepmom, it helped me to understand that whatever I wanted to be, whatever I wanted to achieve, whatever I wanted to do, it was up to me. The same thing that I had to deal with so far as report cards and just making sure that I excelled at everything, it wasn't there as much. So I was able to go outside. I was able to kick it. I was able to do what I wanted to do. And it was just like, okay, um, if you want to be somebody, if you want to go somewhere, you got to wake up and pay attention. Like I really had to get it together. And so that was my transition. So I was appreciative that I learned that at such a young age in being with my mom until like, what, like 13 or something like that. I was able to then gear my life in the way that I wanted to be from the middle of high school all into my younger adult years. So it's funny how history repeats itself and we learn different lessons about our lives and some of the things we repeat in the next time around, we pass these tests. And so I was glad that I was raised in the way that I was raised because when I had more freedom, I was able to make wiser decisions. I wasn't the most wise. I was always one of those that's like, I got to learn for myself. Now, as being older, it's like, oh, okay, you said don't do that. Oh, okay, I'm going to go off your example. I don't got to get drugged to understand not to do certain things. But I really appreciated that. But that was a portion of my life that I kind of repeated. But this time for me, I didn't have a child and I was not married. So now that you have raised an adult, 39 years old, you are 59 years old. We are 20 years apart. Exactly. How do you feel now that, you know, you don't have so much responsibility um, at 59 and raising a child and pushing forward in that way? What What is the feeling now? What's the vibes now? I'm really happy I did that. I, I have no regrets. I really have no regrets. I just, I, I just really want to say that I always did my best. I continue to take the risks. I had to, I had to continually now understand what love is, sacrifice and helping others and to really understand how that fits into my life because I really had to work through that and unpack that as I went throughout the years. So now I, I'm not responsible for anyone. So now I can really truly understand the differences of those things. And then now really learning who I am, you know, always being authentic yeah, some people may not like some things about me, how I say things, how I act. And she play too <laughs> much. Now she act like a child and I'm the mom. Um, and, and like you said, generationally, my dad was the same way. He was very childish at times because as I got older, he played a lot. And I used to always tell my daughter, I said, girl, once you get older, you're going to see I am totally different. She just said how mean I was. But I'm just being me. I, I'm free. I used to always tell her, I am free. And at the time, we did not get along. Like, I did not. I cannot Like me with my dad. Her. Me and she my was dad. always looking at me like, poor, unfortunate soul. <laughs> like, it was just like. But as I got older, um, we are really, really close. This is like my best friend. Like, for real, for real. Mm -hmm. um, I got to keep her out of my business sometimes. So it could be healthy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But. We're very close and I'm glad that we were able to go through that transition because had we not, I don't think that we would be as close as we are. So I really appreciate the transition we had gone through. Because one thing, let me say this, just because you sacrifice for your child, it doesn't mean that your child is going to turn out the way you want them That's to. That's fact. So that, let's get that straight. It was by God's grace. I mean, God's been talking to me all day about his goodness and mercy She'll follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I'm noticing that's who she is. She, by God's grace, has been what God wants her to be. Not me, what God wants her to be. And I am so thankful. And now to watch her pay it forward with her friends is beautiful. Even with other people's kids, it's beautiful. So it's really great to have taken this time to raise her for her to pay it forward because the thing is we are raising vessels to make the world better that's all our, our, our charge is that's it and 
I'm just, I'm grateful. Okay, so in closing. And I'm free. <clears throat> see, she childish. She played too much. In closing, what would the current you tell the younger you? It's like the four agreements. Always do your best. Be impeccable with your words. Don't make assumption and don't take anything personal. Continue to take risks. Continue to be authentic. Continue to learn who you are. I'm free. It causes me to be balanced. It causes me to not care what other people think or feel about me. It does so much for me. It embodies so much. Just those simple words, I am free. But I feel so free right now. I feel like I can do anything I want. I can manifest anything and it happens. That's about freedom. Well, y'all heard it here. She is free. And here on Mental Health, The New Wealth, we encourage you to be free too. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to this portion of the Relationship Series with Vernita Whitaker-Naylor. And above all, remember,